Okay. Hello everyone, <laughs> welcome to this week's teaching. It's week three, uh, Cardiology Week. Um, just want to say a special thanks to all the speakers who are going to speak today. Um, we're lucky enough to have uh, Dr. Hughes, who is a consultant at the LRI, who's going to chair the session for us. Um, and we've also got Dr. Marriott as well. So any questions, <laughs> offer them. <laughs> and of course the speakers as well. So um, I'll pass over to you, Dr. Hughes. Uh, yeah, great. Well, I, I certainly can't take any credit for the organisation um, and even the effort put in by all the three presenters um, and Shiv and Dave. So um, I'm very much a guest here, like a guest chair. So I'm still getting used to all of this. Um, so do excuse any technical difficulties. I will remember to mute my mic uh, when people are talking. But other than that, I'm going to have to figure it out as we go along. Um, I think what I'll do is I'll keep an eye on the chat feed and just... Um, make a note of any questions. I mean, if you're presenting and you want to answer the question uh, during your presentation, I guess uh, that's fine. Um, but if you want to leave them to the end, then hopefully I'll have a list of those questions as the chat scrolls through um, and you can deal with those at the end. And obviously, if anyone else has any comments about um, the answers or the questions, then, um, then feel free to chip in. Um, I think that's it. I think Shiv, you're saying you've got about 20 minutes for each presentation and then uh, five minutes for questions at the end. But um, I gather that these sessions have um, previously, you know, they've overrun a little bit, which is, which is you know, it's not a problem. Um, I guess, um, you know, if they're interesting, it's, it's best to sort of, you know, keep that, keep that chat going, keep the learning going. So, um, so that's just the guide. Right. Okay. So um, from what I understand, was there anything else you wanted to add, Shiv or Dave? Um, Maybe just um, once we get started, everyone just turn off your microphones. There's no background noise. Yeah, great. Great. OK, well, um, I think first on the agenda was uh, Dr. Rami Asraf, Asaf, and he's going to be presenting the cardiac cycle. Is that right? You ready, Rami? I am. Um, uh, I just need to share my screen with you guys. Um, oh, I, need to, I need to allow you to do that. There okay. we go. So what do I do? Um, so at the bottom of the screen, it says screen share. Oh, that's the one. Okay. So there we are. Okay. I guess everyone can see that, can they? Okie dokie. Okay. So uh, thank you uh, to Shivani for organising the session and the chairs of the session, Dr. Hughes and Dr. Marriott to join us today um, in this teaching session. I've been tasked um, with giving a quick overview of the cardiac cycle, um, which is an important um, part in uh, cardiology. Um, so uh, the objectives of the session today is to define the cardiac cycle, uh, systole and diastole, and in particular to explain how blood flows through the heart during the cardiac cycle. The cardiac cycle is uh, composed of seven uh, phases, which are, we are going to discuss in detail and to understand the different pressures, um, flows and volumes um, in each of the phases. Um, finally, we'll talk about the heart sounds and where they occur in the cardiac cycle. And we're going to just do a quick um, overview, just a very brief overview of the ventricular pressure volume loops, which is a particular, um, uh, needs to really to be ideally an entire presentation, but uh, we'll have a quick overview of that um, at the end. So the cardiac cycle, um, uh, the definition of which is the period uh, from one heartbeat to the next um, and it involves three key dimensions. It involves the timing of each heartbeat, um, the pressure, uh, particularly in the left side of the heart, left atrium, the ventricle, the left ventricle. ventricle. Yeah. Everyone okay? Yeah. Um, the, and the aorta. Um, and finally, we will look at the volume of blood within um, the ventricles. So it is um, essentially separated into two parts, systole and diastole. Systole reflects the uh, contraction of the um, uh, atrial or ventricle uh, or the ventricles and involves the ejection of blood. Diastole uh, is essentially the opposite of that. It involves uh, relaxation 
uh, of the muscles and um, filling the time it takes to fill up either the atrial or the, the ventricles. And it's important to remember two thirds of the cardiac cycle is spent in diastole and the third is in the systolic phase. And this here shows just a very uh, schematic of the cardiac cycle. It always starts in atrial systole. Uh, it takes about 100 milliseconds in all and during that time um, the blood is ejected into the, ven into the ventricles. Uh, so uh, phase B that's reflected here you get um, atrial diastole which uh, begins and that quickly moves on to ventricular systole where the blood in the ventricles are ejected uh, into the aorta or the pulmonary artery. Um, and uh, finally there's a period of time where shortly after um, the ejection of blood that uh, the um, uh, atrial will be filling up with blood from venous return or from blood from the pulmonary vein after going through pulmonary uh, circulation. I'm going to explain all of this uh, part in, in detail but it's just to give you guys a quick uh, overview of that. So this is um, a very sort of important diagram to uh, know pretty well, uh, particularly for the uh, primary FRCA. At the top here you have the typical sort of ECG rhythm with your different waveforms. Uh, and then you have the pressure time, uh, uh, so time on the X and pressure on the Y axes. Um, and the key things are to know um, the different pressures within the left atrium, the left ventricle and the aortic pressures. And what we're going to know is the significance of when some of these uh, uh, transect each other, uh, because that's when it involves the opening or closing of the valves. Um, so the first part of the cardiac cycle is atrial systole and um, within here you will have in the ECG is the P wave which reflects atrial uh, depolarization and subsequent atrial contraction. Now um, that involves a rise in the pressure uh, within the atrium and that reaches a point where the atrial ventricular valve, so that's your mitral valve or your tricuspid valves, um, are forced open. Now you would think normally that this would uh, reflect the majority of the ventricular filling. However, actually this during this phase it's only about 20% of the ventricles are filled as a result of atrial systole. The rest is during um, later on in the cardiac cycle during the diastolic phase. Um, however, during uh, exercise where diastole is, is somewhat shortened as you become more uh, tachycardic, the up to 40% of ventricular blood can um, come from atrial systole. And that's a question that I've seen a few times come up in the practice questions. Um, the left atrial pressures, um, and there's a slide at the end to show the different waveforms, but the A wave, um, essentially you will get a, a rise in pressure up into a point where the pressure uh, in the left atrium exceeds that in the in the ventricles and you get a, an A wave and um, once that is once a um, once the A wave um, uh, reaches a certain pressure you'll get a descent in that and that's due to the valve opening and that's why you can see in the diagram on the right I don't know if you can see the cursor uh, as, as I move it uh, shows an increase in pressure here and um, uh, subsequently it does come down from the X descent. The next part of the, um, uh, the cardiac cycle, the second stage, is isovolumetric uh, contraction and that's denoted by the uh, QRS complex, uh, complex and during this part here um, uh, the volume in the ventricle is actually fixed. It's fixed because the valves um, are actually all closed. And um, because it's the fixed volume and you're um, uh, having a contracting or, or start of, of a, a contraction in the ventricles, you will see a sudden rise in pressure. And that's denoted on the red line here and the pressures in the left ventricles, which actually begin to rise quite, um, I guess to move. Uh, quite substantially so you get a massive rise in, in pressure um, and with that pressure rise what will happen is um, the atrial ventricular valves will bulge backwards into the left atrium and that does cause a slight rise here in your atrial pressures and that's reflected here in the C wave. 
platform. Um, this rapid rise, uh, so as I said, will we'll close the AV valves and displays here, all the valves are closed and there is no blood flow, strictly speaking, in this phase. So moving on into the rapid ejection phase, and as the name suggests, this is where you get an ejection of blood. So blood is ejected from the ventricles to force open the semilunar valve and blood is ejected into the aorta. And uh, we can still see that the pressure still actually goes up within the, uh, both within the aorta and in the left ventricle as blood is ejected, but um, later on you'll see it starts to um, start to um, trough, um, it peaks and then it will start to go down. Um, and also uh, what you um, will see is that the atrial pressures decrease during the um, ventricular uh, contraction and that's because the atrium is actually pulled downwards towards the uh, apex of the heart and the atrial size will actually expand and you see the waveform in the left atrium goes downwards. Um, so important thing here is that as it uh, transects at here, um, so as the, as the uh, left ventricle pressure uh, exceeds that pressure exerted on the uh, semilunar valves, you get the ejection of blood. So the semilunar valves are forced open and the mitral tricuspid valves remain uh, closed. Reduced ejection, so moving on to the next phase, um, is reflected in the ECG on the T wave, which uh, shows us the uh, ventricular uh, repolarization. So during this phase here, uh, the aortic and pulmonary valves are still open uh, and the mitral uh, tricuspid valves are closed. Um, however, ventricular relaxation starts to occur and um, the rate of ventricular emptying actually uh, begins to fall. And that's where you can see the pressure both within the left ventricles and the aorta go downwards. Um, and during this time, it's when the heart is in a, uh, beginning to be in a, um, in the move to diastolic phase and the atrial uh, pressure actually rises slowly here. Uh, here. So uh, you will see the um, pressure in the left atrium begin to rise and that's because you get um, venous return and blood from the uh, pulmonary veins uh, after having passed pulmonary circulation. So the atrium uh, starts to fill up with blood. Isovolumetric contraction um, uh, is the next phase. Uh, in this phase, all the valves are closed. You get continuing reduction in ventricular emptying, a massive decrease in pressures. Um, and this, uh, as I said, will we'll close all, all, the, all the valves and the, you will get a fixed volume of blood at the end of systole and that's known as your end um, systolic volume and that's normally in, in a normal uh, individual approximately uh, 50 mils um, and because the atrium in this time are still filling up with blood it, it creates the V wave form uh, which is shown here in the left atrium. The next phase here in the diastolic phase is uh, rapid filling. So during this time, um, your semilunar valves, the aortic and pulmonary valves are closed uh, and your mitral and tricuspid valves are open. And it's the time where you have here rapid um, ventricular filling and it occurs, um, causes rather the ventricular volume uh, to increase. And, um, what happens here is the during the diastolic phase you get uh, suctioning which uh, starts to fill up the of, you get almost a suctioning of blood which starts the filling of the left ventricle um, also to know during this phase and I'll come to heart sounds later on you might have a almost like a tensing of the um, chordae tendae and the atrial ventricular ring and this can cause a, a third heart sound uh, normally in adults, this can be pathological, particularly in heart failure, um, and it, but it might be a, a normal finding in, in uh, children in particular. Um, and finally, the last phase is um, reduced billing. 
So during this time, the valves are as they were in the last phase, so the mitral and tricuspid valves are open, uh, the simulunar valves remain closed, and blood is still ongoing and filling up the ventricles, and the majority of the blood in the ventricles during diastole, and there is a, a rise in uh, ventricular uh, pressures, or some, a small rise as the, the valves are still closed, the aortic and pulmonary valves, um, but the gradient is indeed uh, smaller, it's not as, as steep, and therefore the, the rate of filling actually decreases. And then shortly after that, the remaining uh, blood in the atrial is, um, uh, you get contraction of the aorta, you get the start of the next cycle. Uh, so in all of these uh, phases, which I've quickly gone through, is the seven phases of the cardiac cycle. It's important to know, particularly in each phase, what is the, uh, uh, where, where it's reflected in the um, uh, pressure time graph here, uh, the different pressures and uh, uh, also where the ECG, uh, this occurs. Um, atrial pressure uh, waveform. So this is a, a hot exam question that I've seen uh, come time and time again in particular um, uh, to denote what happens in each of the different phases of the uh, left um, atrial pressures. Um, so your A wave is shown here in the first part here on the diagram um, and it essentially denotes uh, atrial contraction. Um, uh, however, sometimes you might have um, no A wave seen and that's seen in atrial fibrillation. Uh, you might have uh, cannon waves that may be in um, ventricular uh, arrhythmia, ventricular tachycardia, and also in the sort of complete heart block, you might get cannon A waves as well. Uh, the C wave is um, during your uh, ventricular contraction where the uh, valves, uh, the atrial ventricular valves bulge backwards into the atria and that reduces the volume and rise of pressure within the uh, atria. And it also can be due to um, transmitted pulsations from the carotid uh, artery. Your axe uh, descent is um, due to rapid uh, depolarization and the atrial pressure will drop um, as the ventricles relax uh, and the base of the uh, atrium is pulled downwards into the, uh, into the ventricles. Your re wave uh, occurs during ventricular systole um, and that's due to the increase in pressure uh, due to the filling of um, blood within the atrium during, uh, as, during uh, uh, the dice, uh, during the systolic phase um, and you obviously will have a closed valve so as you have a closed valve you're having an increase in pressure as the um, blood is uh, starting to fill up the atrium and your exit descent is due to the opening of the sorry the y descent rather is due to um, the opening of the AV valves and blood being ejected um, uh, from the atrium into uh, the ventricles So heart sounds here, um, should move this up the way. Um, uh, essentially there are uh, sort of four key heart sounds um, which we should be aware of. Um, the most common would be first and second heart sound. So uh, the closure of the AV valves um, is, is, is typically denoted by the, by the first heart sound. Um, and it's, uh, uh, the mitral valve does close a little bit before the, the tr uh, tricuspid valves. Um, the second heart sound is shown later on in the, in the cardiac cycle by the closure of the aortic and pulmonary valves and it occurs as the, um, as the uh, aortic pressure, uh, or rather this, the, the left ventricular volume is less than the sorry, the, it's less than the pressure exerted upon the aorta. Um, the third and fourth heart sounds are things are, are sounds that we we need to know. Um, third heart sound can occur in sort of systolic uh, heart failure uh, due to tensing of the of the chordae tendes um, and the, which support the, the atrial ventricular valves um, and can make the the, the ventricles uh, overly compliant and therefore uh, cause rapid uh, ventricular filling. And the fourth heart sound is uh, occurs when you have sort of an under compliance or reduced compliance of the ventricles um, and increase the resistance and therefore uh, can occur and normally occurs um, during the shortly after uh, atrial systole. 
uh, that can be seen more so in diastolic heart failure. Uh, so finally, pressure volume loops. Now, I'm going to try and talk about this, um, and I'm not going to talk about it for too long because it's a very um, complex area, but uh, it's something that uh, we need to know about, but certainly um, uh, needs a lot of uh, reading, and um, you can find this in chapters of uh, physiology books. But uh, what you have is on the x-axis is your ventricular volume, and on your y is the ventricular pressure. And... Uh, different points on this uh, pressure volume loops is, is reflects the different points in the cardiac cycle and what you have here is um I, the way i've uh, is, is to learn it is from the this point here for from here to here is the the stroke volume and this is reflected by the fact that it's your end uh di end systolic volume uh, minus your end diastolic volume um the pressure slowly rises as the blood flows into the ventricle until you get to the end diastolic pressure. Uh, the valves will all be closed at this point, and therefore the volume is fixed um, at this time at this point during the pressure volume loop. You then will have uh, isovolumetric contraction, and the pressure uh, will rise quite dramatically until the atrial ventricular valves, will close, sorry, the semilunar valves are forced open and you get the ejection of blood. So you have your uh, rapid ejection during the first part and your um, reduced, uh, reduced ejection in the latter part. So this point here is reflected by your end systolic pressure. The aortic valves will close and therefore you get a, 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 all the valves at this point will be closed and um, you will have isovolumetric uh, relaxation here um, so that's all I'm going to talk about uh, for the pressure volume loops but certainly um, I'd uh, advise that there um, to have a read of this in the in the in the books to know what happens particularly in uh, uh, circumstances where you have uh, changes in the preload or afterload as what you'll have is a shift in your pressure volume loops and reductions in stroke volumes depending on, on what it is uh, so that's all I'm going to uh, uh, say for today. Uh, thank you very much. It's very uh, odd sort of talking to myself on a computer, but I hope um, everyone has learned a, a little bit from this uh, talk. And uh, thank you very much to the organisers uh, for facilitating this um, discussion today. Great. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Rami, for that. Um, a nice overview of cardiac physiology, the cardiac cycle, both in terms of the systole, diastole, aligning it with uh, the heart sounds and also the ECG, um, because when you're answering questions in your primary, that's key to understand how it all ties together, because often it's easy to learn things in isolation, but pulling them all together is the sort of thing that you get in a viva. So, um, so it's important to, to see both, both sides of that. Um, and I think I agree with what, with what you say about the cardiac cycle, um, in the left ventricular volume um, pressure loop. Um, it does take a little bit of studying to sort of really anchor it, really get it solid in your mind because um, it, it, it can be confusing, certainly when you're starting off learning that curve. It can be confusing as to, you know, which is systole, what's, what's diastole. Um, and then there's lots of acronyms that you can label on different parts of the diagram and the acronyms all start to sort of muddle together. So, um, so yeah, just working your way around that cycle um, several yeah. times over several weeks is probably what's going to do the job anchoring it in your brains, in your minds. Um, we have actually got no questions at all. So uh, clearly a, an outstanding presentation. <laughs> um, So, uh, if there's no more questions, I believe um, Kaya is next and she is presenting cardiac output measurement. How are you doing, Kaya? Are you ready to go? Yes, I'm ready to go. Uh, huge subject. You can write a book, separate books on that, but uh, shall we just get started? Uh, just give me one second. I'm new to that, so I just have to share the screen. Is that correct? Uh, one second, I'm working on it. Uh, so, can everyone see the presentation? 
Yeah. Okay. So let's start. So hello everyone. My name is Kaya. I'm one of the core trainees and I willingly agreed to do this presentation on the cardiac output monitoring. As I mentioned, it's a huge subject. So this is just going to be an overview. I will try to concentrate on most important factors. The other thing I would like to say is I'm going to present it how I understand. So if there's any question or I'm talking utter nonsense, please raise them straight away and let's clarify it, um, as I go or during the presentation. So the aim of this presentation is to talk about the cardiac monitoring. And I feel it's a great subject and it's been repetitive during the FRCA equally on OSCE vivas and MCQs. So, so we are all myself as well preparing for the exam. And what we are going to talk about is, is actually how can we measure cardiac output and some principles and physics behind the cardiac output monitoring slash measurement. So uh, just a few words and it's going to be really, really superficial. So um, what is a cardiac output? So it's a volume of blood ejected from the left ventricle um, in one minute. And it's a measurement of a flow, not a pressure. Um, all of us know this diagram below that cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volumes. What it exactly means, and um, with, within the heart rate, there are some things that affect it, like hormones, age, and autonomic interventions. And in terms of stroke volume, we've got preload, afterload, and contractility. Now, um, we, we, we've got the clinical situations that you know, we've got a normal HB and um, saturations in our blood is fine, um, but without adequate cardiac output, so without that function uh, hard as a pump, um, we still can cause, we, we can get um, tissue hypoxia. Um, so that's why we want to monitor it. So, and the low cardiac output predicts poor outcome following the surgery. On the bottom, you just have an oxygen delivery equation and cardiac output is quite important part of it. So let's start from some basics. So if we imagine ideal cardiac output monitoring, what do we think about it? So we think that it must be cheap. Uh, it gets continuous um, monitoring. It's validated, operator independent. So whoever with a med medical degree goes and checks um, the machine or the monitoring, it will give them the answer of um, of actually what to do and how to manage the patient, uh, self, uh, self calibrating and automated. But it doesn't exist, unfortunately. So how can we measure cardiac output? So um, overall, we all are doctors, so we can measure uh, clinically. And we know that unfortunately, we are pretty bad in assessing cardiac output. However, there are some symptoms that we can pick up um, after reviewing the patient, we know that that blood flows to many organs. So if we've got um, low cardiac output, the patient might be anxious, might be agitated or comatose. Um, in terms of the skin on examination, we can feel that there's a poor perfusion and prolonged capillary refill. And if we look on the cardiac output from the perspective of the kidneys, there will be a decrease um, urine flow um, and um, even anuria. In terms of measurement cardiac output, we're using some physiology, physiology and physics, um, physiological principles to measure it. And there are some of those listed. So we use the FIC, the FIC principle, uh, indicator dilution, thermodilution, uh, thermodilution, sorry, arterial waveform analysis and aortic velocimetry. And I'm going to explain that. So how I've organized this presentation is I joined them principle with the equipment. Um, I felt that it's kind of worked for me and um, I hope it will work for you as well. So how did I divide the equipment? So we've got the non-invasive one starting from the top with the pulmonary artery floating catheter. So it's the most invasive uh, form of the cardiac monitoring apart from the many other functions this catheter can be used to. There's a PICO, LITCO, arterial waveform analysis, which we know the PGDO, uh, esophageal Doppler and TOE. 
Um, and then non-invasive, which is thoracic electrical bioimpedance, fixed partial rebreathing method, which I actually never came across, but I tried to explain it, and TTE, which is transthoracic echo. So pulmonary artery floating catheter. So it's a piece of equipment and it exactly does as it's described. It's a long catheter looking like a central line um, and its tip floats in the pulmonary artery. Um, it's quite important piece of equipment not used in all the intensive care units. However, its equipment and the questions about it and the function appears frequently on the, on the um, on, um, in, the, in the questions. So um, on the top you can see that there's this um, catheter um, has got many lumens and you can connect a couple of things to it. However, we are going to concentrate on the tip of the catheter which has got thermistor and just behind that there is a balloon. There's also point of entry, um, one of the lumen can work as a, as a central line and it sits quite over here close to the right atrium, uh, right ventricle. And that are the, the most important parts. So um, pulmonary artery catheter, it's a gold standard for the, actually one method of it. It's a, once, it's a gold standard to monitor cardiac output since 1970. And actually we can, measure, we can measure cardiac output, use one of those three methods, or some of them we can actually combine. So that's the fixed principle, indicator dilution and thermodilution. So, fixed principle, adult um, thick was a very clever man who actually described the changes of the concentration of the substance dissolved in the blood. So, we can use that principle and actually calculate the content of the substance in the blood. And um, it's actually times, times the cardiac output and it's the difference between arterial and venous concentration. On the bottom, you've got the thick equations and how exactly it works. If we, we can calculate the cardiac output knowing the oxygen uh, consumption, which we can calculate from the uh, spirometry. There was an old paper about it. And um, um, artery uh, oxygen content minus uh, mixed venous, um, um, minus, uh, mixed venous um, sample um, content. Um, the second way we can do it is with the indicator dye. So people started to have idea, if we've got an oxygen in the blood, how about we use something different, some non-toxic substance that we can easily monitor. And this is when the anthocyanin green comes in place. So um, how we are calculating, what we are actually doing is on the tip of the catheter, we inject the, the marker and then we are using um, arterial blood sample, so we have to have an arterial line. And in timely manner, um, we collect the blood sample using spectrophotometry. We calculate the amount of the um, endocyanine in the blood. And what we are getting is, it's the curve, which is the concentration over time curve. And so starting from the point of injection, it goes up and a bit down. So you've got, um, if you and this is um, um, and if you extrapolate that part to the timeline, you get a nice curve. And around this curve is called um, is actually our cardiac output. We are using a Stuart Hamilton equation for um, for the, to to measure in detail cardiac output. As you can see, this line continues, and there's a another pick and on the some diagrams you have a third pick as well. It's, on, it's due to the fact that when we are sampling the blood we are not taking all the dye out so it's recirculating in the system. And the third method that we can use to, to calculate the, to, to, to actually measure the cardiac output using pulmonary artery catheter is the thermal dilution. So um, this is actually a gold standard and all the other methods has been compared to this one. So as you can see, and as I mentioned it before, in the right atrium, um, there should be the CVC line. So how we are doing is we are injecting a non-amount uh, of saline, which is between five to 10 mils. 
and we know the temperature of that saline by injecting it to the to the to the right ventricle it travels all the way down to the pulmonary artery when the end of the when the tip of the catheter sits which includes the thermistor and we are monitoring a temperature and it's the the diagram that we get is very similar to the preview to the to the to the dye dilution uh, technique but in these circumstances we've got change of the temperature over the period of time and similarly as before we've got a nice peak and underneath uh, that curve it's our um, it's our cardiac output um, this line doesn't reach zero because this there's an element of recirculation however we have to extra and we have to extrapolate to the, to the timeline and again we are using the um, modified Stuart Hamilton equation for heat cons uh, conservation and it's to be honest it's pretty self-explanatory so we've got the known volume of the saline we've got the temperature of the body temperature of saline and two constants there always has to be a constant and uh, there's basic the, the heat correction for the body and heat correction for of the fluid constant and over the period of time on the bottom of the equation so moving forward to the less invasive methods. So I've came across textbooks that said, that stated actually that only PA catheter is the invasive and this one are non-invasive. In my, in my humble opinion, if something you have to put something into the patient's body, this is still classified as invasive, but this is less invasive, if we can agree. So um, arterial waveform analysis, is, um, is the way to measure cardiac output looking at the arterial, uh, arterial pressure waveform. We are all familiar with that, with that form. If we connect, uh, um, if, we con if we've got the A line and connect it to the monitor, that's what we can see. It's the pressure over time. And we are all familiar with the, with the notches and um, changes of it. This is again a separate discussion. But the whole proposal came from early beginning of the 20th century, when they've noticed that if we throw something from the, from the, from the chamber of the heart and it's go through the aorta, it's actually, you know, floating around like in the pipe, so we can, we can monitor and we can um, actually create um, a pressure pulse, which subsequently we can, and we can calculate from that the uh, stroke volume. And if we've got a stroke volume from our equation, we can calculate the cardiac output. So um, we've got two ways of doing that. One of this is uh, pulse counter and the other is power plus. So very briefly, um, this uh, pulse counter, it's, a, it's an algorithm that only looks at the um, arterial waveform. So how we are, how we, how we are doing is, um, it's measured the uh, pulse pressure and uh, stroke, uh, stroke volume variation and converts that into the stroke volume and, and then gives us a nice wave and then uh, we can calculate from that uh, cardiac output. So I presume, because I couldn't find that, that this is how Vigilio works. Power Plus, on the other hand, it's the, it's the system and it's a very complex algorithm that doesn't look only at the shape of the arterial line, it also uh, it takes the arterial line uh, waveform as a whole and it's a four stages transformation and complex mathematics that in the end gives you number. So the pulse counter is used in Vigilio and PICO. List power pulse is used in LITCO and I'm going to explain it further. So um, transpulmonary thermal dilution and pulse counter. This is like a mixture of the, if you remember the um, the uh, pulmonary artery catheter with, with the uh, pressure, with the waveform analysis. What you need for that is central line and arterial line with the thermistor. So how it, how it looks like you use a very similar method. So you take a fluid in this, um, um, here we are using, uh, in PICO, we are using 10 to uh, 15 to 20 mils of ice called saline, sorry, ice called glucose and with of the known temperature and we are injecting it and it circulates through the body to the our arterial line where the thermistor is measuring the temperature 
So you can see that the diagram is very similar to the pulmonary artery catheter thermodilution. However, the peak is smaller because the volume of fluid circulates through the large amount of the body. And the time is a bit further down because the distance between the central line and the arterial line. And again, we're using Stuart Hamilton equation. It allows us for the continuous monitoring by monitoring the pulse counter. However, the, um, the, the injection is used for calibration. The limitation of this, um, of this method is that you need an additional arterial line um, and it's not suitable as for the most pulse counter analysis um, uh, monitoring when you when you have intra abdom, uh, intra aortic balloon pump and you have you've got AF you've got patients with AF. In terms of the lithium indicator dilution and the pulse power, which is a which which is um, litco. Um, again, very similar principle, but on this on at, at this on this occasion we're using the dye. The dye is lithium chloride, which is 0.15 millimole uh, concentration. And what we are doing is we need a peripheral line when we inject the dye and the arterial line with the specific, um, like, like a switch on switch. So when you are measuring, it connects directly to the ion selected electrode and we can measure the concentration of the lithium um, um, ions. So this um, the elitco is actually extensively validated and it's believed that it has got accuracy similar to the bolus thermodilution. Uh, it allows us for continuous monitoring. However, again, for the calibration purpose, you have to, you get, you have to deliver that lithium chloride in initial, lithium, initial bolus. The limitations are that similar to the, to the previous, um, to the to the to peak code that um, when you have intra abdominal balloon pump or when you're in when you're in AF the reading might not be very adequate. The other thing that we have to remember is patients who have got uh, the, who are on the lithium therapy, and there's suggestion that if we perform this straight away after giving the patient muscle relaxant, the um, electrodes um, it can cause certain disturbances and in up in inappropriate reading on the electrode. So we are moving forward to the less invasive um, methods of cardiac um, output monitoring. Uh, I have never seen esophageal Doppler in use. Um, I know that it has been in use and in the certain hospitals, in the certain hospitals. Um, so esophageal Doppler is fancy name for the aortic ve ve velocimetry. So we are measuring the flow of the um, of the uh, blood in the aorta using a Doppler effect. How it looks like is um, preferably on an anesthetized patient, but it's been described that you can use it on awake patients as well. You put the probe, which um, yeah. looks like esophageal temperature probe, um, and you, you, um, it's supposed to sit at the level of T6, more or less four to fifth, uh, uh, third to four, fourth drip. And you position it in the in the way that the probe um, is facing the aorta. Using the Doppler equation, which is which is which is below, we are calculating the the, the velocity of the of the um, of the blood is calculated, and we calculate the stroke volume um, by timing the velocity time, times times integral, which is uh, stroke di distance and cross section of the uh, area of the aorta. So the cross-section area of the aorta can get um, estimated, uh, it can be estimated knowing patient sex, height and age and weight. The result, what we actually, do, what do we get? This is a diagram uh, which shows the flow time to the peak velocity are those notches. Knowing, knowing how the notches look like and making sure that there's appropriate position of the probe we can we can get them in a different shape, and just briefly, that's how can they look like. And accordingly, we can we can act on um, we can um, 
we can support the, the patient is it the fluids or vas vasoconstriction or vasodilator agents. The limitations are you have to be very well trained and um, also it's very much operator observer dependent. Also we have to make sure that um, the probe is in an appropriate position so it's more for the intermediate not continuous monitoring. Going a bit further, um, this, is, this is really one slide just to let you know that we can measure stroke volumes and then calculate cardiac output from it using transesophageal or transthoracic echoes. Uh, very similar, uh, both methods, um, similar, um, similar ways apply. One is we can use 2D mode and the Simpson equation, which shows you the, right, the, the, the ventricle, the left ventricle, and we can, we can calculate the, uh, the area and convert it into the stroke volume. Um, and the second is we can use the Doppler shift effect as we use it for the transesophageal um, monitoring, uh, Doppler monitoring. And from that we have to, we can, we can calculate the, uh, we can calculate the um, uh, uh, stroke volume and subsequently cardiac output using the cross-section area and the stroke distance equation. Right. And now the, to the last two, um, two actually methods. One that I had before many, many years ago in um, ED, I think they've done study actually on that, which is thoracic electrical uh, bioimpedance. So what it is, is, um, is the th thoracic resistance and it changes according to the respiratory and the cardiac, uh, cardiac cycle and it responds in response to the small but high frequency current. You need a specific um, um, monitoring for that. So they look like ECG stickers. You apply them on the neck as shown on the picture and close it to your chest. The main current flows through the aorta and what we are doing is we are measuring stroke volumes from changing the bioimpedance, thoracic bioimpedance during systole. I don't know exactly how it looks like in terms of equations, but for reading about it, um, this method has got loads of it has got loads of limitation and sounds like it's not very good method in in terms of usage, its usage on intensive care, because whatever you apply on the patient body, start, starting from the patient's perspiration through the tubes. Um, patients who are ventilated or having any sort of wires and pacemakers, um, all of that can have an impact on your results, um, which is not really great. And the last one technique, which is the least understand technique by me. Um, I'll try to read about it and I think I need to have a read. Uh, re re it's something that appeared in the 2000s, which is a partial carbon dioxide rebreathing uh, which is indirect thick, uh, thick and the ap apparatus is called NICO. So if you imagine thick equation and instead of oxygen, you put carbon dioxide, that's how it's measured. So the apparatus itself, NICO, it looks like a like, um, piece of tubing that you could take from, a, uh, from the breathing cir circuit. And there's a valve, it's a timed valve. So what happens is you put that equipment in between patient tubes and the angle piece. So what happens is it works in the interval. Interval consists on the normal breathing, re-breathing, and again normal re-breathing, and it repeats itself over the period of the three minutes. So for first 60 seconds, um, patient is breathing normally. Then the time valve is opening, opening, and patients breathe through that through that extensive dead space. Um, what's happening at that time, as you can see on below, the, the CO2 production decrease, but the end tidal CO2 um, increase. And then after 30 seconds, it again goes back to the, it goes back to the normal breathing pattern with the valve closed through the normal circuit, and it repeats itself. So knowing those differences, and using thick equation and taking the time during the no normal breathing and the rebreathing phase, you can calculate stroke volumes. These are quite um, complex equations beyond the scope of this talk, but it is quite interesting. So um, 
that's it from me. There's much, much more things to follow and to learn. Um, the resources that I used are e-learning for, uh, for healthcare and ELA section on the cardiac output monitoring part one and two, I found them very useful. And there's a very good article, quite old, but from, from 2003 from BGA measuring cardiac output, which I found that it's got its basic, basic stuff and it's quite neatly written. And of course, fundamental of anesthesia. So thank you very much for listening. Back to you. Great, thanks Kaya. That's um, not an easy subject. There's a lot of mathematics involved with any cardiac output monitoring uh, or measurement. measurement. Um, and yeah, it can all just seem a little bit much. So you've done a, a really good job there of just taking us a sort of a whistle stop tour through all of those different mm. types of, of monitoring that we use. I think the bottom line is the more reliable ones are the ones that you're going to see in clinical practice uh, or indeed those that have got a tariff attached, uh, ones that are yeah. going to pay the trust money. So um, unfortunately uh, that's why uh, esophageal Doppler came and went because the tariff came and went um, and people didn't really find that very useful um, and now we've moved to things, probably the only one you'll see is a pulse contour analysis, the um, uh, not Libco, the yeah, Luca Rapid, yeah. no, uh, Evo, Evo 1000, Evo 3000. Yes, or whatever. Luca Rapid sometimes. Yeah, um, and then certainly, only, I think the only place you'll see a PA catheters will be on the cardiac ITU, um, and, that, and even then they don't get used very much. So, and I think you're right, the, the, so as you can see, because of all the mathematics, all the equations, all the variables, it means that any variable, you know, any sort of element of, um, error in any of those variables will be multiplied several times the more calculations you do with it so the more distant the measurement the more um, detached it is the bigger the error will be and so that impacts on your reliability um, so yeah but um, it is one of those things that you do just have to go away and read about i think the ones that are interesting from a mathematical or physics point of view are doppler even though we don't use it mm. uh, and the thermodilution techniques because that, that is something we do still use um, and actually, the, of all of the techniques you described, they're probably the, the easiest. Um, and remember, thick principle will come into other parts of the curriculum as well, not just in cardiac monitoring, but also mm. in uh, blood flow and organ physiology as well. So, so you will overlap that. Um, right, going to questions. Uh, no questions, just Dave Marriott says that he's had an esophageal Doppler probe down his gob which wasn't a very nice two hours i told that all he got for it was a cup of coffee so cheap date um right uh, I, think, <laughs> um, I think 